Hello, my name's Fred and I'm a languages student at the University of Oxford. I'm studying French and linguistics. And one thing that I've gained a real passion for through studying French, which is, of course, a very well widely spoken language and linguistics, which is the study of language more in general. One of the things that stood out to me from studying these subjects is just how interesting a thing translation is. Uh, and I've been working on a creative translation workshop for you to go through at home with me. Um, and I hope that through doing this workshop, you'll be able to discover why I find and why so many people find uh, translation to be a really, really exciting way of studying languages. What we're going to be doing in the workshop uh, is looking at a text together in French. Uh, the text is called Persepolis by Marianne Satrapi. It's a world famous book. Uh, and even if you know no French at all, what we're going to be doing is looking at an extract from Persepolis and coming out of it with our very own creative translation of part of the novel. So if this all sounds exciting to you and you want to see how translation works and give it a go yourself, um, then please join me on this creative translation workshop. Hello and welcome to a creative translation workshop as part of the Queen's Translation Exchange. My name's Fred and I'm going to be guiding you through the different stages of this workshop. What we're going to be doing today is thinking more generally about why languages are interesting to study. Uh, in particular, we're going to look at the idea of translation and what it is, uh, and even more particularly at this idea of creative translation, which I will explain to you as the workshop goes on. Um, and then our final goal for the end of the workshop is whether you are fluent in another language, whether you have studied another language a bit, or whether you don't know another language at all, is to come out with our very own polished creative translation of a world famous text. That is Persepolis by Marianne Satrapi. So first to give you a bit of background on who I am and more, more particularly who we are at the Creative Translation Exchange. So the reason why I say who are we on this slide is because this workshop is part of a, a broader thing called the Queen's Translation Exchange, uh, created by Queen's College, which is one of the small colleges that makes up the University of Oxford, one of the biggest and most famous universities in the world. You've probably heard of it. Um, and basically, Queen's College has started this initiative to try and bring a whole load of people together um, to explore sort of translation, why it's useful, why it's really fun, and um, why it's an interesting way of studying languages. Personally, I am a student at the University of Oxford, not at Queen's College, but another college, Keeble. Uh, and I'm studying a degree in French and linguistics. Uh, so what that means I do is linguistics is sort of a more general study of language. But French, what I'm doing is reading a lot of texts and literature in other language, uh, sort of learning the grammar of French and also a lot of translation work. So moving texts or passages from French to English or vice versa, because those are my two languages. So this is basically a, an introduction that will hopefully let you see how e sort of uh, easier thing translation is to get involved with. Uh, and now we're going to look at translation in a more concrete sense. So a warm up to do with translating idioms. And firstly, what I'd like you to consider is whether you know any strange expressions in English, maybe that don't quite make sense when you think of them in a literal way or that say one thing where they really mean another. A good example of this might be raining cats and dogs, for example. Um, if we were to take this literally, it would be quite a bizarre thing because never have there been seen a mass of cats and dogs fall out of the sky. But what we're really trying to say in, I suppose, a metaphorical way is it's raining very heavily by this phrase, raining cats and dogs, which we might call an idiomatic expression or an idiom more simply. If you know another language, if you speak another language at home, you might know strange expressions in other languages. 
uh, that if you were to try and translate them to English, for example, uh, in a literal sense, they would sound very peculiar. Um, but again, they convey a sort of particular feeling or event that uh, in a sort of creative and imaginative way. What we're going to do now is have a look at the French idioms, at some French idioms, sorry, um, as this is the language we're going to be focusing on today. So we have uh, four French idioms and I'll read them out to you. They all have these weird illustrations to go with. So it's quite a peculiar thing, but I'll read them out. In the top left, we have avoir la frite. Then we have couper les cheveux en quatre, être lessivé, and raconter des salades. So these phrases, just I guess you can think about what they mean. You might not know any French at all, but you might be able to spot some words that you recognize or guess from the illustrations what they might mean. And now I'm going to give you the sort of translations of each of these idioms. So firstly, we have avoir la frite, which means you might recognize the word frite if you've been to France before. Um, and you might be able to see in the illustration that it means to have the chip, which seems like a very, very bizarre thing to say. If, I mean, even if you have a chip, it would be strange to say, I have a chip. Um, but what this means in a non-literal sense, in what we might call the idiomatic sense, is to be full of energy. And obviously, if you translate avoir la frite literally into English, it becomes to have the chip, which you might not know or guess means to be full of energy. But in fact, in English, we do have a similar expression relating to food that means the same thing to be full of energy um, that we could come up with, maybe to be full of beans. So this is a more idiomatic translation from the French to the English. The next idiom we have is couper les cheveux en quatre. Um, and so obviously you'll see here in the illustration, a guy looking through his microscope or magnifying glass, um, trying to cut up a hair. Um, and so, yeah, the literal translation is to cut the hairs in four. And perhaps this might mean something to you in a kind of metaphorical way. If you think about it, there is similar ways in English of idiom idiomatically saying sort of to look at something very closely, perhaps to nitpick and to split hairs is one that really kind of is similar to the French in a surprising way. So although idioms are often quite different from language to language, we can see here that there are often some similarities in the way that they're expressed. Next, we have raconter des salades. Um, you might sort of recognize a couple of words in this expression. Raconter looks a bit like recount um, or otherwise to tell. And salad is, of course, salad or lettuces, as you can see in the illustration. So to tell salads is the literal translation. Um, and again, we kind of have a similar thing in English. I think one way you could express it idiomatically would be to tell tall stories. Also, there's another food related one. There seems to be a theme with these idioms. Um, to tell porkies is a really, really good expression. Um, you might have heard of it, you might not have done. Um, but yeah, it's another sort of crossover, but it means the same thing. To tell salads, raconter des salades means to tell two, two stories, to tell lies, or to tell porkies. Finally, être lessivé, um, which as you'll see from the illustration means to have gone through the wash, um, which I don't know, you might be able to sort of think about how you might feel if you had <laughs> sort of been thrown in a washing machine and gone through the wash. Um, and that might give you a clue as to what this idiom means to be tired. Um, and again, an English fairly equivalent idiom is to be washed out. So what I hope that these idioms have shown you is that obviously language is not always sort of doing what it seems to be on the surface. And particularly when we try and translate things, it might not work. There might not be a way to literally translate the words from French into some words in English that mean the same thing. So often we have to go one step further to get from avoir la frite to have lots of energy. And even we can sort of be creative and try and find a even more 
expressive equivalent in the target language, that being English, and we found to be full of beans with avoir la frite was a very good example of that. Now I'm going to, we're just going to have a short discussion to think about translation in general and really what is translation, as I've mentioned it so much already uh, in this workshop. But yeah, I mean, you can start thinking about what translation is yourself. You might have your own definitions of it. You might have done some translation yourself before, or you might have read translated texts. I think in general, it is about moving language or moving text uh, from one language into another language. But as we've already seen that this sort of converting um, isn't necessarily a straightforward thing always. And you might have used Google Translate before uh, where you can sort of put in a phrase in one language and it will instantly pop up with an equivalent. But very often this is quite faulty. It doesn't really capture the detail of the language you're translating from. And so often translation sort of needs humans to uh, be successful. I'm just going to move myself over there. And another thing we might consider when thinking about the notion of translation is what is the point? I mean, so many different types of text get translated, whether it be books, um, whether it be speech, of course, you have interpreters, whether it be films that need subtitling or political documents, perhaps that need translating into a whole range of languages. What is the point? Well, there is often a kind of artistic purpose between these things to try and spread art or poetry um, around the world. And sometimes, like I said, with a, a political document, for example, it might be a necessity that lots of different speakers of different languages can access a text. So to think of some things that translation most definitely is, it's international, as I've already mentioned, there is definitely a need to spread language and writing um, from country to country uh, in order to communicate and in order to sort of from an artistic sense, spread uh, art around the world. It's cultural. Um, and so what I mean by this is that often you're not just translating sort of words from one language into another, you're translating sort of a whole culture, language, different languages kind of make you see the world in different ways. And often this is a part of the process of translating from one language into another. And translation is something that people study. Of course, I myself, uh, I'm a French student and I study translation in great depth. And it's something that people do as a job, either translating books or translating uh, other written texts or interpreting, for example, are all very highly regarded jobs to do with translation. And hopefully you'll be learning some of the same skills that those jobs require today. Translation can be difficult, of course, as we've already seen through our idioms warm up. It can be creative and we've already seen perhaps that we do need to be creative to think of effective equivalents in one language uh, for a phrase or a saying in another language. And I hope also you'll find out today just how fun translation can be because it's really, really cool way of looking at language. Finally, I'd like to look closer at this notion of creative translation that I've sort of discussed already. We've already seen how idioms are things that can't be directly translated and that require a bit of extra thought um, about how we might make that switch from a phrase in one language that doesn't quite make sense when literally translated. And so we have to go one step further and be a bit creative with it. What is often the problem is that a literal translation just doesn't sound natural in the target language, the language that you're translating into. And so you often need to think outside the box or kind of rejig things to make it sound, for example, more English if you're translating into English. There is definitely a lot more freedom in translation than you might have thought before. Uh, if you've done exams, to do with translation, there is often sort of this right answer that you have to get. But in reality, there is a lot of freedom. There's a lot of different options. There's never really a right answer in translation um, if we can come up with a creative way of saying things. So next, we're going to be looking at a particular text and a particular language 
to sort of lead us on to our creative translation later in the workshop. Now that we've had a look at what translation is and thought about it in a bit of a broader sense, we're going to look specifically at French, which is the language we're going to be translating from today. Um, before looking closer at the text itself that we're going to be translating a passage from. Firstly, I'd like to think about French, the language. And as you can see, there's a map of the world here. And I'd like to show you sort of just how widespread French is as a language around the world. Of course, you'll know that French is spoken in France, um, which you can sort of see in the centre of the map just below the United Kingdom. But I'm going to perhaps show you that French is spoken in far more places across the world or a far broader range of places across the world than you might have realised. So maybe you'll take a minute now, perhaps pause the video uh, and try and think of some places other than France that you might know where French is spoken and you could try and point these out on the map. So maybe pause the video now and give that a try. And then I'm going to talk us through some examples of French speaking countries around the world. So firstly, of course, you will have known that France is where French is mainly spoken. You can see it in the center of the screen there and it pops up nicely. The French flag. I just gave, uh, <laughs> gave the next country away a little with my animation. But um, yeah, I'm going to also show you that French is spoken in North America, in Canada in particular, which is up here in the top left. Uh, and yeah, so French is one of the official languages of Canada, along with English. And I think it's mainly spoken in the Quebec region in the west of Canada, but there is a quite large French speaking population uh, across the country. So, yeah, that's another example of a French speaking country that you may have got. Um, another one is on a, another continent. Uh, and the example I'm going for here is Senegal in West Africa. You'll see it pop up there on the West Coast. Um, and yeah, another French speaking country uh, with French as the official language. Uh, and in fact, a lot of Africa, especially North and West Africa, are French speaking. So it's got a sort of big impact there. Another place that perhaps you're less likely to have got as a French speaking country is over here in Asia which is Cambodia. It's a small country bordering Vietnam and French is one of the recognized languages in Cambodia. Um, it's spoken by a decent number of the population. And so, yeah, I mean, you'll see already from these four examples that French is spoken on nearly every continent in the world. I'm going to give us one more example of a French speaking country, and this is the country, in fact, that we're going to be focusing on today, not France, but in fact, another Asian country uh, just to the west of Cambodia. And it's here, Iran. And you'll see the Iranian flag pop up. And this is a country that you may have had no idea sort of had a French speaking, a high French speaking population. In fact, the reason for this that you might not have known uh, is that French was previously an official language of I Iran, leading to a lot of the teaching and sort of public uh, language use being in French. And we are today going to be look, looking at a text that is set in Iran and is written in French. So quite a, a surprising uh, place to be looking at from a French point of view, I would say. So to look a little closer at Iran, we're going to be looking at a specific period in the country's history. and. This is a period that was known as the Islamic Revolution or the Iranian Revolution. So during the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a revolution, an uprising from the people, uh, which ended in the Iran becoming, moving from being a dictatorship, which meant that one man known as the Shah sort of had all the power in the country to becoming a religious republic, um, which on paper means that the people have the power, there's a democracy. And of course, this republic in Iran was uh, based around the religion of Islam, hence why the Iranian revolution is often referred to as the Islamic revolution. Now, at the time of the revolution, as I'll move myself over here again, um, there was 
certainly huge amounts of, of chaos and violence going on in Iran with sort of public demonstrations happening very, very regularly, fighting between the people and the state, perhaps the army and the police. Uh, and there was a lot of riots going on during that time. So it was very much a period of conflict in Iranian history, but a very key period that eventually they emerged from as this republic. So the text we're going to be studying today with that in mind is called Persepolis by Marian Satrapi, who is an Iranian author. And this book is set at the time of the Islamic Revolution. It's an autobiography, which means that the author Satrapi uh, is writing about her own experiences uh, and in particular her experiences as a child growing up at the time of the revolution with all the sort of chaos and uh, rioting around her. It's also a graphic novel, which is really interesting. Um, what that means is it's sort of told in pictures and captions rather than large bodies of text, um, almost like an extended comic book. But it is, in fact, a novel. As you can see, I've got it here. This is the English translated version, actually, but it's fairly thick and it's all told uh, in pictures and captions and speech bubbles rather than a sort of long novel that you might be used to. So it's an interesting text from this uh, perspective too. And as I said, it's based on Satrapi's own childhood experiences of the Islamic revolution. And as I've also mentioned, it's written in French. And as we've discussed, this is because at the time sort of preceding the revolution and up to the revolution, um, a lot of Iranian public life was conducted in French. And in fact, in the book, Maji, um, Marianne Satrapi's younger uh, self goes to a French school and of course she grows up to write this novel in French. So thinking a bit more about Maji, who is the protagonist of the, at least the early parts of Persepolis, uh, as a 10 year old girl growing up during the Islamic revolution. And so I guess it's important to think about how a 10 year old might react to all the chaos and violence around her. I think it's fair to say, if we can put ourselves in Margie's shoes, that you would be very scared about all the violence. You'd perhaps be frustrated that you have different things sort of getting in the way of your life, stopping you from going out, stopping you from seeing your friends perhaps. Um, and you'd feel confused. You might not have any idea about the political reasoning behind this, and you might just think it's violence for no reason. So a very difficult time, I think it's fair to say, to grow up in. Another thing we might consider before looking at the text is what sort of language a 10 year old might use. I think it's probably quite likely that Margie would use quite simple language. Uh, and this would reflect, I guess, her confusion to do with the period she was growing up in. And so going forward, when we're translating, we might want to think about uh, capturing the sort of language that uh, the narrator Margie might use. So we are going to think about translating an extract from Persepolis in the next video. We've sort of had a, an introduction to French, the language, and to the text itself, Persepolis. So we can now think about translating an extract from the text, and you'll see on this slide that uh, obviously it's in graphic novel form. You'll see the pictures and the captions above uh, written in French. And this is the extract we are going to be thinking about translating today. So for the translations, you will need the original text and blank template. Um, I'm actually going to be showing the text on screen. So you might not need to print that out, but print out the template for your final translation so you can write in the captions yourself uh, and in the speech boxes. You'll also need the glossary, which is in the folder with the other resources. Um, and that will be helping us to do our initial literal translation from French into English. Uh, you'll need your creative minds at the ready, of course, because we'll later be looking at doing a polished creative translation of the text. But as I've already said, you don't need to know any French um, to do this translation because the glossary is going to give us a really good starting point 
for getting from French to English, and then um, you won't need any knowledge of French to complete the translation. So I'm now going to show you the extract we are looking at. I'm going to read through it in French, uh, and of course you may well not understand any of it or not know what it means, but you can look out for words that seem familiar to you, that maybe seem similar to English words, and you can also look at the pictures and try and piece together how the story is kind of developing over the page. So I'm going to flick through and read it out to you. So, mes parents manifestaient tous les jours à Balleroy. Ça commençait à dégénérer. L'armée leur tirait dessus et eux leur lançaient des pierres. Les soirs, à force de marcher, de lancer des pierres, ils avaient des corps battus, même dans leur tête. Hey, « Hé, maman, papa, on joue au Monopoly ?»« Ma chérie, on est fatigué, ce n'est pas le moment. »« Au Monopoly, je rêve, ah ah ah. »« Ce n'est jamais, jamais, jamais le moment. » So, you've had the, uh, heard the text read aloud to you there, you've seen the pictures and you might have a rough idea of kind of what's going on just from that. But now what we're going to do is use our glossaries to produce a word for word translation from the French into the English. So what you'll be able to see on the glossary as you've got it printed out um, is every word in the text um, in its French form and then English equivalent. And so what you're going to do is, in fact, all you need to do is convert the French word into the English word we can we don't really need to think about changing the word order at the moment you might know that french and english word order are a bit different in some ways but at the moment it's absolutely fine to kind of keep things exactly as they are because we're just piecing together the individual word meanings at this stage rather than trying to make it sound like proper english and obviously in this way some parts of your translation are likely to sound funny or unnatural but this is okay this is exactly what we want at this stage uh, and I'm going to show you a quick example of what this literal translation is going to be and, and how you're going to go about it. It should take you around 15 minutes. Um, and so I'm going to just help you start off or show you what the, the stages are to doing the literal translation. So what we're going to do is focus on the first caption in the top left of this um, box, this panel. And... So, as you can see, it is mes parents manifestaient tous les jours. So, if you have your glossaries in front of you, you'll be able to literally swap out word for word the French to the English. So, mes uh, translates into English as my. Parents, you'll probably have realised that this is actually the same word in English and in French. It's parents. Uh, manifester. We can swap out by looking at our glossary and it's protested. Tu is all, les, you'll probably know if you're a bit familiar with French, is the, and jour is days. So this gives us the literal translation of my parents protested all the days, which doesn't actually sound particularly like an English sentence that anyone would come out with, but it gives us kind of the rough sense of what's going on, the basic meaning of the words, even though they might not all be in the right order or sort of sound perfect but this is kind of the stage we need to be at this is as far as we need to go with the literal translation so what you should do now is just go through the rest of the text and do as i've done here this literal uh swapping out english uh french words for their english equivalent and not worrying too much about how it might sound um what i might what i'll recommend for you to do now is actually to do this word for word translation on a separate bit of scrap paper and leave the blank template text, um, leave that for the moment so you can fill that in later on with your creative translation, which is going to be more polished and sound more like real English than this stage. So what I'm going to do is flick through each of the slides, uh, each of the panels of the text here on the PowerPoint, and maybe you can pause your video on each one, get this rough literal translation noted down. It should take around 15 minutes, like I say, um, and then we'll come back together uh, to look at the creative translation in a moment. But 
you might want to pause on the first slide here and translate it. Then you can pause on this one here. And this is the final one. So now you should have a literal word for word translated version of the whole text just sort of noted down by the side to inform your creative translation, because now we're going to be turning these literal kind of not quite right sentences uh, into a real English translation that sounds kind of authentic and maintains the same tone and creativity of the original French text. So we're going to think about creative translation and this is going to be a longer process. It should take around 25 minutes or even longer if you need, because you're going to have to sort of consider your options, think outside the box and try and think what the best way of translating um, or the best way of moving from this literal translation to sort of more real sounding English. Uh, and that is kind of our focus. And I'll show you in a moment sort of how we might go about doing that. But yeah, we want to make it sound like real English. We want, want to make it sound more polished. And two ways we might go about doing this is thinking about word choice. So we might have got one word from our glossary, but in fact, you might think thinking about synonyms. So words that mean the same thing that they might fit better um, in the text, sort of depending on the, I don't know, the impressions that those words give you. And again, I'll show you in a moment the uh, different choices that you might be able to make with word choice. Uh, and idioms, of course, as we saw right at the beginning of the workshop, these phrases that don't quite make 100% sense if we're translating them uh, from French into English in a literal way. So now we're going to have to go one step further and think of what it means in English. Um, and even if we can think of an idiom in English that means the same thing to try and make it sound um, as polished and as effective as possible as a translation. So it's really going to be about thinking about the, the outside the box and being creative at this stage. Another thing to consider is making sure that the words and the illustrations go together. Obviously, it's a graphic novel, so this is quite a key thing that we uh, that we think about. And we can try and capture the mood of the original text, um, especially when we're thinking about Margie's perspective, the sort of language she might use. We might want to think about how she sees the things going on around her and how this influences her narration of the text. So I'm now going to give you uh, an example of how we might creatively translate this first caption that we looked at earlier on before our literal translation. Of course, we should now have the literal version, my parents protested all the days. Um, but how can we move on from this to a more natural, more poetic sounding translation? Uh, so one thing we can do is think about word choice. And so the glossary told us that manifesté in French um, converted to protested in English. So that's probably what you'll have. But we can also think about synonyms, equivalent words that might sound better in this context. There's demonstrated, which perhaps has a slightly different shades of meaning to protested. Marched even, as you can see in the picture here, there's obviously people going out and physically um, walking up and down the streets to try and express their uh, anger at the dictatorship. So we can think about word choice here and the best synonym we might want to pick for the the glossary, the literal translation that the glossary gave us. The other thing that you'll have almost certainly noticed in this sentence that just doesn't sound right is all the days at the end, even though that's the literal uh, translation from French, it really doesn't necessarily work. So what we have to think about is what a more English, a real English way of saying the same thing, of saying all the days might be. And I think every day is probably the most obvious one that comes to mind. My parents protested or demonstrated every day. It sounds way more natural. And um, this is a good sort of starting point for making our tech making our translation sound more like real English and more polished. Always could be another potential option. My, my parents protested always. 
that doesn't sound quite right. But what you could do here is be a bit flexible and creative with the word order and say something like, my parents were always protesting, which I don't know, it's a bit more um, kind of lively than my parents uh, protested every day. Um, so you could think about that and perhaps what my creative translation of this caption might be is my parents were always protesting. And so this should give you a basis of what the idea of creative translation is. We really, really want to sort of go wild with different ideas to do with word choice, to do with the order of the words, making it sound like real English and sort of giving it that real punchy effect um, in our polished creative translation. So you can think about each of the captions or speech bubbles that you've translated so far with the literal translation and look into synonyms for the words in those and just making them sound generally more polished. And so again, what I'm going to do is flick through the slides and you can pause, note down your, or just come up with ideas for your creative translation. And then eventually, when you've sort of thought of the best option for your translation, fill in the blank template and you should, um, with enough thought and creativity, come out with your own polished translation um, that should sort of flow really well and really capture the mood of the text. So I'm just going to flick through each slide and you can pause here to think about the creative translation again. You can pause on this section and you can pause on this section too. So you should have taken about 25 minutes to think about the different options for your creative translation and to come up with the best choices to do with words and idioms and phrasing um, to make it sound like a really, really good and engaging English translation. And what a good thing to do at this point, if you feel like you've spent enough time um, weighing up the options and you filled in your blank template is to reread your translation and try and notice whether it sounds like real English, whether there are any bits that are still a bit jarring, um, even if the word order is a bit off and just play around with it even further. But yeah, I'd encourage you to read your translation through, um, maybe pause again. Um, but now what I'm going to do is look at the professional English translation. So this is the translation in the version of Persepolis that I have here and you will have your own idea of, of course, what best fits the text uh, in terms of a creative translation. But this is the professional published version. So we're going to perhaps compare your creative translation with the professional English version. So I'll read it through. My parents demonstrated every day, which is already, of course, a bit different to the best option that I came up with when I was thinking about creative translation earlier. Down with the king. Things started to degenerate. The army shot at them and they threw stones at the army. After marching and throwing stones all day, by evening they had aches all over, even in their heads. Hey, mum, dad, let's play Monopoly. Darling, we are tired. Now is not the right time. Monopoly, I can't believe it. Haha. <laughs> it is never the right time. So you'll be able to see in this professional translation some of the choices that the translator has made about moving from the French to the English uh, and obviously being, I don't know, maybe in some areas creative, in some areas sticking quite closely with the text. So you, you may well have come up with more imaginative ways of expressing what they said uh, in their professional version. And we can think about this. How is yours different from the professional one? And chances are you will have come up with some far sort of a, a broad range of things that differ from that. Um, and you can also think about which is better because chances are you might think that yours is actually more expressive, more creative than the professional published English version. Your self translation is very much a personal thing. There's a lot of freedom as hopefully you've seen. And so you might well feel that you have actually captured the French text, the mood of the French text, even better than the professional English translation. So you should now 
have finished your translation, come out with a really great, exciting, polished translation of this extract from Marianne Satrapi's Persepolis, which is a fantastic achievement. And I hope that this workshop has shown you that sort of no matter your skill, your, your previous knowledge of language, that we can all sort of engage in translation and come out with something really, really exceptional. So one thing just to consider before finishing the workshop is what we've learned about translation. Of course, at the start, we thought about how difficult translation can be, how translation is actually a potential career for people, a potential thing to study. You might feel inspired to go on and learn more about translation and do more of it. And I hope that that is the case. Um, and I think hopefully in general, you'll have seen that studying languages is a really, really exciting thing. You might have thought beforehand that it was kind of this boring uh, learning things off by heart. But I think this workshop will hopefully have shown you that there is a lot of creativity. There is a lot of freedom to learning languages and they, they are a really, really exciting thing to study. And so all I have to say now is well done for completing your creative translation. Um, I hope you're proud of it. And yeah, hopefully you do go on and think about uh, doing more translation in the future. But well done. And uh, thank you very much for taking part in this creative translation workshop.